This conference will now be recorded. Henry or Sam, who's going to go first? Do you want to do the shorter presentation first or the longer? Sam, I think you're up first. You ready? All right, I'll do it first. All right, Sam. So everybody, Sam is a uh, is a, is a well known in the house, and uh, he's an awesome guy, and he knows a lot about a, a lot of stuff. So looking forward for for his talk, and uh, take it away, Sam. All right. Thank you, Sam. Please put this slides because people are gonna ask about the slides in the chat channel. So I'm sharing a show. You see the presentation now. Yep, looks like GoToMeeting picked up on it. All right, I'm Samuel Greenfeld. Uh, I've been a CISSP certified for about 10 years, recently one for the software variant, specialized in software quality assurance, especially on the security side. Black Hat scholarship recipient, this went there last year as a result. Also have done many of the conference recordings for Hack Miami that you see on the YouTube, as well as recorded the first year of Pacific Hackers Conference. And the reason I'm giving this talk is I'm a licensed amateur radio operator for the past uh, 30 years. Let's see, Make sure I'm just on the right screen with the cursor. So the agenda. What is amateur radio? What can you do? What you cannot do? Operating practice, how to get your license in the conclusion, I guess. I was hoping to do this in person so we could show off toys. Unfortunately, we're not at the library, so we cannot really go off into showing toys today. Uh, so the top service, what is amateur radio? Uh, technically, it's defined radio communication service for the purpose of self-training, communication and carried out by amateurs, that is, uh, duly authorized persons interested in radio techniques solely for, with a personal aim without a pecuniary or really a financial interest. Uh, it's regulated by the Federal Communications Commission in the United States, and it's I would say it's not really a single hobby, it's a range of possibilities. Uh, that said, uh, the reason I'm saying it's a lot like using a car. I mean, you can just drive around the car casually to where you need to go. You may want to build a car from scratch. Uh, you can do that with amateur radio. You may want to pimp out your car and make it all fancy. and Or you may want to do try to race it or something. And those are all sorts of things you can do with amateur radio as well. Uh, so again, you can do conversation locally around states, the world. It's a concept of directed net, nets where one operator controls the flow of traffic and who should talk when. These are typically done to exchange message traffic. We also use it to manage an event such as a marathon or an incident such as a hurricane. It's a concept of de-expeditions where people are actually going traveling internationally to locations to run amateur radio. Usually they choose a nice looking location in a rare, which is rarely has may not have very many amateur radio operators to be at. You can said you can contest. There are people who try to work all states or continents, work 50, 100 countries, who can make most contacts in it in a certain amount of time. Uh, maybe bonus multipliers for using certain techniques and stuff. Uh, field day is your general. Emerge kind of a practice emergency, whatever run, which is done every year, which really just crowds the bands. Uh, it's your fourth weekend in June, presuming it still happens. Uh, there's lots of local events you might be able to see someone doing stuff. Alternatively, there's Winter Field Day, which is done in January, but it's not done by the same organization. And your concept of sending around QSL or response cards saying put little postcard saying I talked to this person or nowadays modern equipment is the logbook of the world which is an online system and you can experiment with amateur radio different operating modes different designs internet links although that's pretty common nowadays so not really as experimental you may want to try how far can you go on low power is very commonly done uh, satellites or earth moon earth bouncing is also done a bit 
and I just gave an example of FTA is weak signal communications. Here they're repurposing a protocol used actually to talk to deep space probes. And, and it's basically a very automated communication that can be done to transfer things back and forth. Uh, volunteer emergency services are also done. You may just do said volunteer for like a marathon or a rock or run or other event. Uh, you have the cost Aries, which is amateur radio emergency service. It's more of a private sector things. More officially, you have RACES, which is radio amateur civil emergency service, which is explicitly defined in the rules that define amateur radio. In practice, these are usually the same groups. Often have off other groups out there. You have Hurricane Watch Group, Saturn, the Salvation All Army, Silver Air Approval, Patrol, Military Amateur Radio Service. Contributed traffic might be needs, maybe health and welfare. There's a lot of maybe a lot of side traffic, which may just be people trying to confirm that people are still alive or people passing along messages confirming someone is still alive. One thing I will note, especially since September 11th, these groups often require explicit training, registration, background checks, all done before the emergency actually happens. If you're doing anything, that involves the government, chances are you're gonna to need to take FEMA's instant command service, ICS courses, uh, like 100, 200, and 700. This is not, this is a federal requirement. This is not something can easily be bypassed. Some groups also like for amateur radio 800. Uh, ARL likes ARL on level one for Aries groups. And if you're working with the Red Cross or something, they may also want you to have their certifications as well. Uh, so, so now we've gone through what's allowed, what's not allowed, generally having a financial interest in a conversation, uh, public broadcast, music, foul language, commercial, legal usage, encryption. You can't encrypt things on amateur radio, sadly. You can do like a message hash though. Using more than the minimum power required generally also is frowned upon. Uh, that said, is these are generally speaking, there are kinds of exclusions, like if, you, for example, you had an agreement with NASA to rebroadcast the audio from a space station, uh, well, and they happen to play music to wake up the astronauts, well, that's okay. Or if you were, you scheduled a time to talk to the space station with your class, and you were the teacher, and you were being paid to be their teacher, that's also okay, too. And there's, as I said, there's a, some gray areas with this. One talk is often how much of the process of can you order of a pizza on over amateur radio and the interpretations of that actually have varied a bit over time. Uh, here's just a picture of some of my stuff. I just put together the Kenwood little radio in the middle here. Let's see, let's turn on a little pointer. This little radio here is 20 years old. It still works. It's just an AM FM mobile rig. I just decided to show mobile rigs here because I know you have seen I, it's a lot of you carrying around bell phones. So these are a bit more powerful. That's, so that's just an FM radio, dual band, typically dual band, we mean two meter for 40 rig. Up on top here, we have an ancient, also 20 years old, roughly speaking, packet radio. So it sends data about 1200 baud. And down below here, I have a modern radio, which is the Ciezu thing here. That comes with a, that one has USB, that is a built-in sound card, that is upgradable firmware, that has all your modern fixings. So radio like that nowadays, it also does HF, VHF, so it covers a lot more bands. It can do a lot more AM, FM, digital modes, a lot more on its own. A radio like that, if you've got it pre-made, that's only a, that one's about uh, twelve hundred dollars. Uh, the modern equivalent to something like this probably is three hundred, four hundred for the middle for the mobile rig. And that one probably nowadays would include Bluetooth. It would include include the digital radio that's sitting on top of it. It could include GPS and a whole bunch of other things. So radios have evolved in general. So. Uh, up getting into operating practice because I know we don't have so much time. Cur there are th currently three classes of licenses you can get for amateur radio. You start out as the technician, uh, go up to the general, and now you have the amateur extra or extra class. 
Uh, licensing is cumulative. You have to pass the lower exams to get the higher license. Some also some discontinued license classes, but there's still people licensed under them, such as the novice, the technician plus, and the advanced class. Uh, these at all point had their own theory exams, but the main difference you could say is they required more various different levels of Morse code knowledge than the current ones did. However, since uh, the early 2000s, Morse code is no longer required. One thing I will note, because some people are paranoid here, is license records are public information. They no longer include information like your date of birth, but the basic record that you have an amateur radio license and your address will be public along with your call sign. That said, you do not need a license to receive amateur radio. This is primarily a license to transmit. A technically legal license historically would be also argued to be a a license to be the control operator of an amateur radio station, as well as a license to have an amateur radio station, but that's almost a technical distinction. Uh, here's the little bit of math. This is actually the only math I want to point in here, is that you have the concept of a wavelength is equal to the speed of light divided by the frequency. So basically, what well, I'm going to, why is the, this giving is an example here, why is the amateur radio band here between 144 and 148, roughly 150 megahertz known as two meters. It's because if you divide uh, 300 by 150, you get two. And the reason that matters is was when you're creating an antenna, they're often cut to fractions or multiples of the base wavelength. And, and if necessary, I mean, I can pass paste a link to this, here's just a band chart. And I'm also, I just pointed out, let's just point around the laser. So here are various amateur radio bands. You can see they break it down by what license class can do what, where in terms of frequency. Uh, this reason I'm also kind of mentioning this is you can see that there are a lot of bands, they vary in frequency. The bandwidth, they said again, three meters in frequency, and you can see the naming. But they, notice how big some of these bands are. And it's they're not very big if you think about it. Because if you look historically, I'm, I want to just compare it to Wi Fi for a second here. Because if you know your two gigahertz Wi Fi bands, you have three independent 20 megahertz channels. Most of these bands here are not 20 megahertz wide at all. I mean, two meters is only four megahertz wide. Uh, you go down to 30 meters, that's like uh, 0.05 megahertz wide. So we're talking a lot less bandwidth than you have with uh, your Wi-Fi, especially once you get to five megahertz Wi-Fi, you got two meters. You got your 40 megahertz channels, which are now 80, and now once with Wi-Fi 6, 160 megahertz channels. And while you can do that at higher frequencies, you, you don't necessarily have access to that at lower frequencies. Uh, and most for most of the amateur radio bands which are in common use, uh, you, you're all sharing less band, much less bandwidth than your typical Wi-Fi connection. But that doesn't mean you can't do voice and stuff. It just means that the radios use a lot of more historical techniques for audio. Uh, for example, with you have your base here, you got, what would you call, uh, just borrowing from Wikipedia this video, you have this baseband signal, uh, which is basically you speaking. That gets shifted up in frequency to you talking over here. I mean, if you would, but if you're AM, if you make an AM signal, historically you had a copy, and had another copy over here just of it, of you speaking, along with this carrier here, which if you were just doing CW, all you really need is this carrier, which is very little bandwidth. But if you're smart, what you can do is you can just, we only have to really transmit this data, so you don't, you can, don't need to transmit this large carrier, which means you can also increase the power of this and use, regardless of what you're using, very little bandwidth. Same, alternatively, you could just transmit this bottom piece here and you still are getting your point across. And that's basically how it's done with the very, uh, is at, at least at the lower frequencies, is you just are very conservative of how you use bandwidth. It complicates the radios a bit, but it 
makes them it's much more efficient use of the bandwidth so get yeah, the high level basically the international telecommunication union which had defines the world into three regions region two defines what the fcc can allocate and the fcc then turns around and says given a, an amateur radio license of a given class this is where you can operate at a more granular levels there are best practices recommendations that organizations such as the arl put out but they are not necessarily where you uh re re required by law uh repeaters and beacons should be coordinated if they're so there are organizations that'll try and coordinate what frequency is used by what for repeaters within the best practice regions for where a repeater should be located if you are coordinated you are actually have have a bit you are considered more important than someone who did not get coordination should there be a problem as i said uh just because small, small, lower frequency bands have less data your allowed symbol rate varies by band uh as however modern encoding is more efficient but they have to update the rules but still you're not going to at lower frequencies you're not going to get wi-fi bandwidth in 50 megabits a second it's just not theoretically possible some allocations are on a secondary basis amateur radio shares their frequencies and others and they may uh, some allocations actually have been lost like you may have noticed there was a gap in a band on the pre previous slide that was because ups at one point thought about using that for tracking packages uh, eventually it did not happen but uh, the band section was lost anyway uh, uh, these bands also vary near country borders as well if you travel internationally. Uh, so if you go close to Canada, there, there may be frequencies which are used in Canada for different purposes. So if you get too close to the border, you can't use them for amateur radio. Uh, that said, we have the concept of call signs, like and just like you hear call signs for TVs, whatever, you have call signs for, for your for amateur radio operators, just like radio station and everything else. That said, amateur radio call signs all have a number in them. Typically we refer to them in like, like a one by two format would be one letter, a number, then two more letters after it. Uh, within Florida, you're gonna have a, all have a call sign, which begins with four. If you start out by getting your call sign down here, if you go, if you're in California, you're gonna have your call signs always starting with six. Uh, it used to be decades ago that if you traveled around the country and moved, you would have to change your call sign to match the new region. That is no longer the case. Uh, so they vary by class. By default, they're issued sequentially. Uh, if the higher the class license you get, the longer you, the shorter of qual a call sign you qualify for, but they're no longer change when you moved around the US or change your license class that used to be automatic just gave some examples like before BOG originally was a person I actually worked under K2RF somehow K4FAUs at Florida Atlantic University and they've had that since 1964 but more re a more recent development is if you don't like the call sign they gave you automatically there are vanity call signs you can pay for just like getting a vanity license plate so you got W4WDW is at Walt Disney World. If it ends in MOT, it's often a Motorola one. WX4NHE is the National Hurricane Center. And as is an example here of an inheritance, W4BUG, the original person who held BUG, which is a club in Broward County, died. But since, but because there's an inheritance preference, uh, they were able to retain the call sign. Uh, so also, as I said, the concept of club stall signs, which are very much a lot of the use of the vanity call signs. Often if it's an individual getting a vanity call sign, they just want something shorter. Uh, there used to be a concept of racies call signs for those emergency groups, but they no longer exist. So racies groups have tried to grab their old call signs back as club call signs. If it's a super short call sign, it's typically for a an, an special event. And you have to use your call sign regularly during conversation. There are ID requirements. I'm not going to go too much into 
to the to stuff. But during this is Hack Miami and possibly Pacific Hackers, we're going to get into the technical stuff in the terms of the operating stuff. And, and I want to get into the stuff really mostly that you're not going to cover in the guides. Obviously, with power supplies, you need to have pro proper voltage connectors, whatever. As you had, obviously, you should also consider surge currents because my big little radio typically wants a 30 amp power supply. But even if you turn the power down all the way on it, it may accidentally blow, it might may accidentally trip a smaller power supply because it needs a strong current to start transmitting even at a lower power. My older radio doesn't have that issue. But getting back to this slide, uh, you have Anderson power poles. So especially since September 11th, they've been looking to standardize uh, how everyone connects. So you can just borrow someone else's power sources. So Anderson power poles are your very common power bus. So you have, I get here, I have a picture of a power supply with uh, Anderson power poles. We have a picture of this rig runner thing which has power poles and the connectors for power poles are uh, genderless. So you can take a cable. So the jack is the same as the plug. You can just plug right into each other. There are some, now there are some various size of connectors for power poles, but the, it turns out that three twenty, the 15, 25 and 30 amp connectors all share the same external power size. So, they vary on the back as to what wires you connect to, but it gives you an easy way to create a, a power bus at 12 volts that everyone else can connect to. You may also have started seeing this kind of stuff, these kind of connectors on PR and other 12 volt supplies on like Amazon and stuff. Antennas, uh, this could be a talk in itself, can be, can be homemade, they can be cheap, expensive, mass produced, operating frequencies control their size. May, may require ground plane or something. Traps techniques may be in used band. Uh, they, they're going to vary obviously in the power you can stand. Like if I take this tiny little antenna here, for, they can stick on top of a car. It's going to take a lot less power and stuff than this big one here that I can just stick in a car. Uh, when you're, you're putting an antenna on a car, consider wind load. One thing I will note if you have a special antenna like this, if you're putting a car on top of antenna like be sure to consider extra functionality like if you can fold it over like this one can be folded over uh connectors again vary widely uh <coughs> smas and reverse smas you typically see on on higher frequency devices that need less power Balfungs are a prime example of using reverse sma well, everyone, the radio you see on the left there is using a regular SMA connector. Just means they swap which part is supposed to have the male and female parts. A UHF connector is a historical popular connector used at HF and VHF frequencies. When we're talking HF, VHF, UHF, there are some general ranges for what frequencies are in those range, very high or ultra high or things like that, but there's some room to play. BNC connectors may be on stuff in the 1990s, but I haven't seen them that popular now. N is more microwave, and NMO is another type of antenna mount you may find on cars. Uh, cables, again, cables obviously vary in size. They've got a super tiny thing. Obviously, the fly here, which was so tiny, I don't know, you don't want to know how much loss it has. But then you get thicker connectors, like I think an RJ8X cable in the middle there, then RJ8U is the twice the thickness. So that one, that thicker one has twice half the loss per foot than the one in the middle. You have to consider when you're making a cable one, you have to consider how lossy they are at the frequency you want to operate them at. So I have an antenna over here made out of LMR400, which is a super ultra lossy, non lossy cable, which is about the thickness of that one, but even half half the loss of that. So the other thing is cable quality varies widely. You need to be aware of that. So you can get a cheap Chinese cable or something, or maybe a, a f expensive cable, And you, but depending on where you get it and the quality of the cable, just because they call it RG8X or 8U, a lot of these mil historically had mill spec standards, but a lot of Companies are not really making them to those standards anymore. 
So if you have a poorly soldered on connector or something, you may have an issue where your cable may be more lossy than it otherwise could be. It's also perfectly possible for you to go out and buy your own cable and then use that. Uh, grounding and ground planes. Be sure to properly ground everything. Should only be a single path to ground. You do not want to ground loops. It's the same thing with wiring the electricity in your house. Uh, do not want your transmitting to be hot. Uh, some of these have metal cases. If there's a floating ground, you could have a risk of a RF burn or something if you touch the case of your radio while it was running. And since this is obviously Florida, if you're in considering outdoor antenna installation, consider lightning protection. Uh, vehicle installations, depending on your radio set, my big guy does not like, would not like a cigarette lighter or a jack. It's just an electric jack, it's only 10, 15 amps. So even if I turn them all the way down, just starting, I mean, we might accidentally blow a fuse. So if you have a radio like that, you may need to consider using the fuse box, wiring uh, a tap there, or doing a direct wire to the battery. Most cars in the US should be negative ground. It's possible that you use positive ground, and you're gonna have to consider that if that happens. Newer cars, mix aluminum and steel. Why is this important? Because if you touch two types of metals together, they start reacting with each other, and there's some risks of one destroying the other. It's like the anode inside of your water heater getting eaten slowly. So you may, if, if you have a car that uses a mix of these, you may need to consider if you need to use dielectric reeds, fast fasteners or things like that when hooking up the radio if you have to bypass the normal fuse box or other circuits. You also may not be able to put a magnetic mount easily on the aluminum surface. Also in newer cars, uh, they often have a battery monitor on the negative terminal, especially if they have an insta start system. So they turn off the motor of every start light. If you bypass that, you're going to be drawing current away from the battery, and the battery monitor is going to get very confused as to why the battery seems to be in poor condition than it is, because it thinks it should know how much current is going through the battery, and you, there's some current going through the battery that it doesn't know about. Uh, if this happens, usually these are in the negative terminal. You can use them to, to ground to the chassis of the car if it's negative or you otherwise have to do it. Again, always fuse your power lines. You just, I've even seen a negative line fused, as confusing as that is. So you want to make sure that there's no risk of if, if something happens, you want to also fuse as close as possible, reasonably possible to the battery so you don't accidentally. Uh, cause damage to the vehicle. Uh, if you want to do computer stuff, there's plenty of computer software for whatever you want to do. Uh, many things are now controllable by USB or serial ports. Sound modems are the art of using uh, the radios. Uh, your computer is a radio. You may use an isolated audio interface to then get that into the radio without risking having a problem back. Just like you have T TCIAP was derived from X25, AX25 is a rootable protocol, which which amateur radio. And, and it's Linux incidentally has a kernel module for it. So Linux on its own can root AX25 just as natively as it knows TCP IP or IPv6. There was there historically also is on an entire eight subnet on the internet, which is just dedicated to amateur, amateur radio. That said, uh, they realized that subnet in today's day and age was a bit big, and there was this sale of roughly a quarter of it to supposedly, to, if you believe Wikipedia, for Amazon for over $50 million. So if you wanted to know how much an IPv4 address is worth, it's worth a lot. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the actual details of that sale, though, have been somewhat obscured but that's what's believed to have happened. If your S is just logging, is logging positions, all sorts of web interfaces, uh, you may just log, log your contacts, there's software to do that. And if you wanna send messages, uh, you can, there's software to do that too. Uh, concept that is covered in the course a bit, and it is a concept of standing wave ratio, which is a ratio of your forward to your reflected power. 
uh, you want when you're transmitting, uh, not all your, if you had a perfect mesh antenna, all your power would go into the antenna, which would be a one one scenario, which is ideal. Uh, but in practice, you're not going to get that. There's always going to be some sort of reflected power because antenna isn't perfectly tuned or your cable isn't or a connector in the middle has a, a tiny little reflection off of that. On your radios can tolerate this a bit. Uh, if your, your, your basic HF FM radio for higher frequencies isn't necessarily going to let you play with it, but at, at the lower frequencies, you can have an antenna tuner compensate for minor errors. Ideally, you don't want to exceed 2-1 or 3-1 on this radio ratio because you can damage the antenna. Here I have some examples of stuff of two SGVR meters. You can also have a digital meter. One here just uses a single line. If I show you here, this one just uses a single line to measure SWR. Here's an example of a dual fancier meter. It's just on one meter, it's showing you the forward power and the other meter is showing you the reflected power. And where they intersect on these two lines cross over here, you can see where your SWR lies. Uh, if you're testing, uh, do not transmit into your antenna. You can test your transmitter using a dummy load, which basically is a big resistor. Uh, they do not have to be big, very big. I have a 300 watt dummy load. I'm just holding in my hand here. Uh, but if you're looking for something which needs to handle a longer term, uh, you need to transmit for an extended period of time or at higher wattage, you can get an oil filled paint can, basically. These are the size of paint cans. And those are dummy loads that you can transmit at high power on for a, uh, an extremely long period of time. Uh, RF exposure limits uh, by government regulations. On, we, you do have to limit the RF exposures caused by your station. Uh, that said, there are two sets of limits, those involved with operating, those with the public. It's up to operators to prove that they are in compliance. Uh, in, in general, it's in, there are, this is probably the most calculating thing you could possibly done do with your station. Fortunately, there are a variety of people who put calculators on the web, which can help you try and do this. There's also a lot of things that can come into consideration that will help you, such as the fact that uh, you don't have to worry about uh, if you're below a certain power limit, at least at the moment. Um, and there's also factors that come into play, such as you're not transmitting all the time. So most of the time you're receiving. And also, depending on what type of, of, of transmission you're making, you may also get a little reducing factor as well. But however, the FCC has looked to harmonize these regulations across all of their services. So there will be generic exemptions replacing the amateur radio specific ones. However, I cannot tell you what's going to happen with that because that's still going to happen for the next several months while they're working on it. If there's an emergency, any, I could say, is there any questions? Because no one said anything yet. But not, not I can keep good. going. You're good. Emergency use. Anything goes if there's an emergency, but you have a be better to have a good reason for doing it. Realize amateur radio is unencrypted. Uh, this does not mean that you talk to the nice police dispatcher who asks you to politely get off their frequency. I have heard a story of that happening. Um, but outside of an emergency situation, just someone casually transmitting with something where they should not be. But uh, the FCC may alternatively limit amateur radio operations as they see fit during an emergency. Third party traffic. Uh, you can let an unlicensed person operate your super your station if you're supervising them. You're still ultimately responsible. You can relay a message on behalf of someone else that you received in the past, so long as it doesn't break any other rules. That said, if you're going internationally, uh, you do have to have a third party operating agreement to send traffic initially. There's also an additional identification requirement. You have to identify at the end who you were talking to. This also gets a bit complicated with internet services because if you're, you're triggering a transmitter remotely over the internet in another country, uh, then that kind of falls into their third party rules. And I've once watched somebody using a service called Echolink traced off of an international node because they thought they couldn't 
remote, they weren't allowed to remotely do that internationally. It's hard to say without knowing the rules of the other country if that was actually the case. Alternatively, you can go internationally with amateur radio. There's three, I'd say three main agreements for amateur radio going internationally. Some of these agreements are automatic. Some require you to apply ahead of time. Be sure to take a copy of your license and the appropriate paperwork. Uh, I mean, FCC for one of the agreements, FCC just gives you a three page printout in three languages that you take with you, copy your license and you're good. If you go up to Canada, you just bring your license and your certain identifications and it works. But there's other cases where you have to formally apply. And the allowed frequencies will be those under the, the treaty and allowed in the visited country. One thing I will note is that some of these agreements were written back in the age of Morse code. So if you don't know Morse code and can't copy Morse code at the set rate, if they haven't modified those agreements, you may actually be knocked down a class in terms of what you're allowed to do internationally. Harmonics images, I'm just bringing, basically your, radio, your modern radio is in a simple crystal radio that, that works for AM. So you have this concept of bringing down the frequency like you saw from a higher frequency to lower frequency, just like in your, your CPU may run it at three gigahertz, but the rest of your PC may only run at 400 or 800 megahertz, because it's a lot easier to take those frequencies further than the three gigahertz used inside of your CPU. <laughs> The downside to this, this is just an example I took from Wikipedia of a heterodyne receiver, super heterodyne receiver, which is a very common design. You can make multiple stages of this. If you get into the SDR talk next week, they just loft off where that demodulator is and that's where your SDR starts hooking in. The problem with this is that uh, when you have a local oscillator, you actually can receive two frequencies. It's one you're trying to receive and then there's a, the intermediate, uh, the one you're not trying to get. There's also, as I said, harmonics, just like, are just multiples of your frequency. So when you're transmitting at like 20 megahertz, although you would never actually you say there's 25, because that's more closer to amateur radio, is you're also gonna have multiples of that frequency. You're gonna be technically transmitting at 50, you're gonna be transmitting at 100, and also a half of 12.5 and stuff. But you, ideally you wanna keep those to a minimum. And your receivers also have those kinds of risks of sensitivities as well. And this comes into play, as, so you, when you look up a radio spec, you, they'll, they'll give you why image re rejection and things like that to tell you how sensitive the receiver is and how much it can avoid getting confused if there's an additional signal thereby. This especially comes into play with the Chinese radios. I know I, I, a lot of you guys have been picking up on those bow phones. I have one too. Uh, in general, amateur radio operators are able to modify other radios for use in their bands. And this is generally not allowed for other services. Valve phones and similar are in a great area. There was one FCC cease and desist on against a valve phone importer. Uh, cheap radios are not necessarily as good transmitters or selective receiving as expensive ones. Yes, you can. That said, they are putting a lot of downward pressure on the pricing and possibly the quality of the fancier radios as well. So it's hard to see where this is going. So because you can buy, as people have pointed out, you can buy one valve, you could buy two or three valve phones for the price of a more expensive radio. And yes, that more expensive radio may have Bluetooth and GPS and other stuff built in, but it makes it a very hard sell when you can just get a radio that you can toss aside, even if the manual isn't the best and stuff. Interference, amateur radio is greater than part 15 devices generally. Part 15 being those devices you have, uh, which, which you buy, all those devices you get at home that say may not cause interference, but may not cause, generate it, cause any interference, but if they get interfered with, they have to accept it. <coughs> that's, that's pretty much all your home devi devices with computers and stuff in them. Uh, so. If amateur radio is interfering, technically you're being you're not in causing anything illegal there, but you're going to very much upset your neighbors. Uh, other services are greater than amateur radio. If you're interfering with aircraft or something, you're in trouble. On uh, general, though, it's best to be nice. Uh, this does not mean you intentionally transmit at full power to try and blow someone else's stereo. 
I have heard of a case where someone actually did that and it worked, but I don't recommend doing that because you probably would get in a lot of trouble if someone actually found out. Uh, but when you, when you have interference, ideally you want to try and eliminate it at the source with your like a low pass filter or high pass or band pass. If you're trying to get it, if you've seen like also a choke on a USB or a power cable or something, that may also, it's an attempt also to keep power from either getting into or out of a device. You may have purchased where the system is uh, having issues. Uh, rules enforcement, it's primarily self policing. Uh, one thing I will note, which is uh, it, this recent development, the official observer program you may reach read about is replaced with volunteer monitoring. Uh, Stole get if, if you can if you get too bad they'll, they'll uh, the, the only they'll just tell you politely, please fix this. Uh, the, but if not, they may refer to the FCC. The FCC in general doesn't really have the budget that they'd like to have now, now as much as they used to in terms of enforcement. But if you are interfering with something like a commercial radio station or something, or, or you do get to the level you know the FCC, you're they're going to make you pay for it. Very, I've regularly read of fines, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars. So, but ideally, it's you don't want to get to that point, but it, I think it's very rare for it to get to the point. I can think of one example in Broward County where someone is constantly interfering with things and jamming for the fun of it, where it probably will get to that point, but that's generally not the rule. That's it, have radio in your house. I, here's an example of a lovely clause from a declaration for a condominium somewhere in Palm Beach County. No ham radios without permission of the board. Uh, this co also comes from an interesting era in the 1990s where I think the HOA lawyers thought they were more powerful than the government. I had a few people tell me a clause like this probably is not legally enforceable, but how much do you really want to try and prove that is always the case. Uh, uh, Over the Air Reception Device Act is uh, another law out there is a law, it's not an HOA rule, it's actually a law, uh, which allows, is what allows you to have a TV dish and antenna within the air, quote unquote, area of exclusive use of your house. It overrides some HOA municipal restrictions for these. This does not mean I, I can think of another association who has a clause which attempts to say that all the little things in OTAR still requires you to go through their, their committee and have your have your satellite dish approved, even if it's fully inside your house, uh, and then it has to still go through all your their rules and their little beautification committees and stuff. I have also read an FCC opinion which line by line shut down one of those clauses. That said, uh, over OTAR does not cover amateur radio, so you cannot use that as a basis for having having an antenna inside of your fully enclosed patio, even if it's not out poking outside of your house. Uh, PRB1 is the closest thing to an amateur radio equivalent, but it only applies to municipalities. Basically, says a municipality can't deny you having a reasonably sized antenna stuff, but it does not override certain concerns. So we're still waiting for legislation to cover amateur radio and HOAs. Uh, amateur Radio Parity Act is repeatedly proposed, it's yet to pass Congress. In general, it's probably don't ask, don't tell, but if you're causing problems, uh, like someone's DSL modem starts going nuts every time you try and transmit. Uh, you may have to try and work with the, them. It's probably just best to be polite and proactive. You may have to find yourself buying little RF chokes and stuff to put on their stuff if you absolutely have to, but it's probably on you just in general because they're not going to, the other person who's having interference isn't necessarily going to know what to do. Uh, getting a license, who can get a license in the US? Anyone, pretty much, who is not an agent of a foreign government. That said, if you were uh, convicted of a felony, there's a more recent requirement if you're doing anything with the FCC, where you have to describe, provide an exhibit explaining why getting, giving you a license is in the public interest, not with, withstanding the conduct. Uh, there was a study I saw, read about this, it does, not, it does not look like the FCC is really denying anyone for the most part if they had a felony. 
pr provided they provided this exhibit. And that exhibit though is public information. Usually though, I've, some of them have been filed privately. There is no age limit on amateur radio. Uh, how old do you have to be to be licensed? In my family, it was before cell phones. Amateur radio was the daddy caller to see how close daddy was to being home. And licenses are generally valid for 10 years. Uh, that said, you have to use some online systems to get your license. Uh, the FCC has a system called CORES, which currently has two versions online. One uses what's referred to as the FCC registration number as your username. There's a newer system out there which can handle multiple FCC registration numbers. Uh, you want to get your FCC registration number before testing. Why do I say that? It's because as part of the FRN registration process, you have to give the FCC your social security number and other information. That is not set public, uh, but it, you will have to give it to them. Well, part of the stuff the FCC does with the application is a so-called red light review where they make sure you don't owe them and possibly other divisions of the government any money. Uh, the UAS is this other system, which is what refers to as the, is so basically you think of cores as their equivalent of Active Directory or their SAML authentication provider, whether it's their authentication system. ULS is a separate system which, which focuses on licensing. Uh, that said, when you finally get your license, you do not want to download the public reference copy of your license. You just look your name up, search in the public record and say, oh, I can download my reference copy of the license. That's not the one you want. You want to log into ULS, currently using your FRN password. I don't know if they support email password login for it. And download your electronic authorization to get the official copy of your license to post around your house or wherever you carry with you while operating. This is that the license is public, but if you put your phone number or your social security number, something in the course registration, that is not public information. If you had a business registration, uh, you, you would have to worry about it. And you only need one FRN number, even though the newer system can support multiple. Study guides, there's lots of ways to study. If you get an ARL study guide, it's going to probably focus on the theory, then tell you to read the test questions at the end of each chapter. You can also get study guides which focus on the test questions with theory as commentary as you go through them. The W5YI group tends to use those. Question views themselves are updated every four years, but they're fully public information. You can find all sorts of websites where you can play with the question pool. Some will require you to log in to see them, some won't. Some will just let you download the entire question pool and you can just read it yourself. And if, unless you're going for the fully high class license, you don't have to worry about any uh, upcoming expirations. Taking the exam, all known exams are in person. Uh, there was there's some possibilities. You, a group in the last one looked into the feasibility if you could do this online, but as far as I know, no one has come up with the ability. Uh, volunteer exam coordinator groups administer it. Decades ago, you had to go to the FCC to take the exam. That has not been the case for a very long time. Uh, these are often done monthly. Large events such as DEF CON have their own exam inventions. Uh, smaller events as well. What to bring, photo ID, the FRN number, pencils, ca a ca calculator, probably non-programmable is best. Photocopy of anything. I don't think a certificate of successful completions really are relevant because you can't really get one license with getting a previous. I doubt most examiners will let you take a higher level thing without taking the lower level one first. And this is exam, there's an exam fee that's may often done. This is only the time you have to pay a third party to do anything with your license. I mentioned this because once you get your license, you'll get say, congratulations, please join this group, please join this. Uh, what, please here, here's our catalog, please buy from amateur radio equipment from us and 20 other things. Uh, but you also have groups periodically saying, hi, oh, you need to renew your amateur radio license. You can pay us to do it for you. Uh, you don't have to do that. You don't have to go through uh, the VECs for anything after this point. You can just do it with the FCC directly unless you really want to use a VEC too. Um, various national societies that promote amateur radio, U.S. 
this amateur radio relay league they'll they'll obviously send you something once you get your license but membership is not required there's also lots of local amateur radio groups i could refer you to uh, there's also like national other national groups out there like tapper which originally stood for tuscan area packet radio but now they're a national and do a lot of other stuff it's amateur radio growing Usually my favorite site for looking this information up what doesn't have stopped updating for some reason but there's probably at this point probably around 800,000 amateur radio operators also the life, average life of the license is more than the half-life of the license so in terms of raw numbers amateur radio is still growing the licenses are not expiring as fast as they're being added but this does not necessarily mean that people are very active uh, unfortunately, either a lot of people are just got their license and are idle. I tend to be pretty idle myself. Um, and if you look at an actual amateur radio club, a lot of them tend to be older than the Hack Miami groups, just on average. Uh, in conclusion, it's amateur radio. I'm not quite sure. I was hoping maybe someone would have had questions or wanted to go into a topic. Uh, that's basically everything. I had to say on the subject, and I guess are there any questions? The things. Um, if you want, I can hop in here just a little, a couple of quick things. And mind you, I'm not licensed for a ham radio operator, but uh, so Claymore and I have actually been kind of studying a bit on this topic over the last year or so. Um, mm -hmm. We both purchased from Mike's Electronics, which is over by Fort Lauderdale Executive Airport. He's yep. not open all the time, but he. Is still open, and you can get the AA, I'm sorry, the ARL ham radio license manual from there, which is really good. It's got a lot of great stuff in it. Uh, and one of the things I also purchased a while, little while back was uh, there's a book called uh, Pass Your Amateur Radio Technician Class the Easy Way. And what this guy basically did was he's been an, a licensed radio guy for a long time, and he did something that I ultimately did earlier. He basically took downloaded all the questions the entire pool set from ARRL's website, which anybody can do. And what I did was I went and basically deleted all the wrong answers. So if you look in the events on Slack, I've basically posted a PDF that I created that is the entire test pool of questions. But what I've done was I've eliminated all the wrong answers. So it makes the book a lot smaller, easier to go through, and should help you out as far as memorization Granted, you still probably want to go through the full licensed book as far as like just to yeah. understand really what it is you're talking about. But for just purposes of passing the test, this PDF file that I've posted up there, it's a stupid easy way to get there, actually get there. And like I said, that easy way by Craig Buck K4IA uh, is also a good, very good book. It's a bathroom book, if you will. Anyways, yeah. yeah, to an extent, I'd say take doing an exam like that is kind of you should. You should know the theory at least behind all the basic math questions and the theory stuff but I, I i can understand you wanting to memorize like the questions on the on like what is this frequency range that i'm allowed to use on this band if they're giving very similar examples but i i would say it's best to understand the theory and not just why a specific answer is correct right and that's why i said i also advocate getting the full big red the big red book the ham radio license manual from ARRL, which will so go can, a lot more in depth. Yeah, you can get these books from a variety of sources. Uh, as far as COVID-19 and Mike's Electronics, Mike's is an example of a local store. We're very fortunate to have one in South Florida that's still around because a lot of those don't exist anymore. Uh, there's also a lot of national change if you had to get equipment internet that, that will provide, ship it from elsewhere in the country if you have to get stuff. Uh, Mike's Electronics, though, for COVID-19, I think he's only open in the mornings and you have to call in advance and possibly see what he's doing. But he yes, is still open. Either. That might be possible because the last time Claymore and I went there, it was actually like uh, it was before the whole uh, coronavirus thing. So Yes, he's, he, does, he does have COVID-19 hours and restrictions, but you'd have to call him. I think you have to call him in advance. Hey, Sam, I got a question for you. This is uh, Phil. Um, I'm actually going to be doing the SDR talk in, in a few weeks here. Um, 
Do you have any recommendations for book not necessarily related to uh, the test in particular, but more as you were saying the theory and fundamentals? Unfortunately, I think a lot of the books tend to focus on the theory and fundamentals. If you have a license, a book, prob a, the RL, probably the book that's probably the most common one out there, though it's a very, very, very thick book, is if you wanted to go into all sorts of details of lots of things, is the ARL handbook which they update yearly, which is just a whole book full of articles on how, how to do all sorts of crazy RF and other things. Anybody who uh, wants like manual stuff for that, I've got a crap ton of PDFs, uh, hit me up and I can definitely send them over to you. I got everything from antenna theory to radio theory, so. Excellent. You got a question. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I thought that Danielle was speaking. So I, I went and got my uh, uh, technician license uh, kind of on a whim. Uh, so what, what's a good starting radio to get? I, I'm not eager to drop 1200 bucks or even, you know, 300, 400 bucks. Well, what, what are you trying to do? Are you just trying to talk locally? Um, I don't know. Just good introduction radio, right? I mean, I got the license. I don't know what to do with it. it uh, so I just wanted to, I don't know. <laughs> Good decent starter set, I guess. I mean, well, you could start with like handhelds. Handhelds don't tend to be very expensive radios. If you have a local like repeater to talk to, you should also like possibly look into getting involved with your local amateur radio groups. Some of them, like there's a group in Palm Beach County has its own shack sitting in a park. And that's a good, possibly a good, you should look around and see what they recommend. I would say just, they don't know. It's very. It's a very open question. If you're just looking to casually talk to someone locally, then you just need a little handheld, might be sufficient for your use. But if you're looking to talk, talk internationally, then you're probably look, and you're probably looking at plus if you have room, putting a dipole outside of your house or something, which is just a big long line of wire. Then you might be looking, which that's very cheap to do. But then even used, you might be looking like for like a five hundred, maybe a five hundred dollar HF radio. The HF stuff is probably a lot more expensive than the FM radios because they do a lot more bands and stuff. And even older HF radios tend to hold a lot of their value for whatever reason, primarily because the basic radio theory has not changed much in years. Even if you, they don't have built-in fancy digital signal processors and things, waterfall diagrams and stuff that an SDR equipped radio can do. Yeah, there are a lot of good uh, SDRs out there that you can find on Amazon and on the web. There's also, there's a couple good backpack radios. I was trying to actually put the link into this GoMe channel, but it's not letting me for some reason. But like for 200 bucks, you can get a pretty decent, powerful backpack radio with a 10 hour battery life. I mean, yeah. you mentioned the, the Baofengs. Uh, is getting one to play with a good idea or not? And if so, which one? They seem to have quite a few models at roughly the same price range. I think the Baofengs are actually okay for a starter radio. Just don't admit that you're, that's what you're actually talking on because a lot of the amateur radio guys blast the, uh, the Baofengs. Another good resource to look at also for those of you guys who actually are on Facebook, there's plenty of ham radio groups that actually can share a lot of information as well. I've done a lot with those guys. Yes. It, is, it is possible to lock down a bell phone so it just transmits on the amateur radio bands. I've done it, but it's you'd have, but it, that tends to be where something else with a bell phone, uh, be sure to set the alarm mode to local. Otherwise you may fi find yourself accidentally transmitting a siren over the, all over the place. All right, guys, any other questions for uh, Sam, Will, or Claymore, or Phil, actually? I think a couple people joined in on that. All right, um, well, I, next I, up, one, go ahead, sorry. Go yes, ahead. Uh, one, of, one, of, one of the guys mentioned the book that eliminates all the wrong answers. I just, I, I didn't quite catch that. If you can, maybe, I don't know, maybe put it in the chat or maybe yeah, I did. That. It's under the events. It's called ham.pdf. Are you on the Slack channel, Leo? 
Yes. Yeah, on the Slack channel. Also, also on the Slack channel, Slack system for the percent 27 Slack. They don't call it the channel ham radio, but there's the channel radio frequencies. Yeah, I'm a part of that one as well. Radio talk. All right. So are you part of the Slack? I'm sorry? Are you in Slack with us? No, I am not. I'm, I just uh, I saw that I saw this event on my um, on the app, and then I just joined. You know. If you would kindly give me your, if you want to be invited to the Slack channel, give me your address, and I'll send it on to the admin. Cool. Yeah, okay. How can I? Send it? Right. You can direct message me in the go to meeting chat. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, or if you just want it directly from me, hit me up. It's will.net at gmail.com. I'll send it to you. It's not a big file. It's only not, it's not even a full mag. Okay. All right. Um, is your name William Net? It's, yeah, that's me. Will.net at gmail.com. All right. Uh, Henry is up next. Rob, did you want to do any kind of introduction, or are we just going to turn it over to Henry? No, I, I think Henry should go for it. All right. Henry, you ready to go? Yep. Perfect. All right. I am making you the presenter. Poof. You are the presenter. Amy Cat. All right. Take it away. Thanks. Um, so we're going to talk about Mimikatz. Uh, just a quick run through about what it is, uh, its uses, and how it's been integrated into other tools. So you'll have a lot of flexibility. Now, in order to understand, we will have to briefly go through uh, Active Directory authentication. I'll try to cover that part uh, faster than the rest. So what is Mimikatz? Uh, it's an open source tool that allows to view and save authentication credentials. So you're, you're in a workstation, you can use Mimikatz to dump the credentials. You can see clear text passwords, you can see um, password hashes, stuff like that. With that, you can just copy the credentials. You can, if you don't have the clear text, uh, clear text password, or plain text password, you're just, um, and you have a hash, you can actually just pass the hash of the password uh, to authenticate. Um, you can use uh, Kerberos golden and silver tickets and pass those tickets. There's also a technique called pass the key or overpass the hash. We're gonna talk about that. But basic, basically, a bunch of different attacks open up once you use Mimikatz and obtain this information uh, from the workstation. So it looks kind of like this. Uh, it does require admin rights. So basically you run the tool, uh, you're gonna type privilege debug in order to escalate privileges, and then you'll, you'll be able to just dump the passwords. As you can see in the picture, uh, you're gonna see that it says down here, NTLM, that's the password hash, and the uh, plain text password that will come from it. Now with that, you can do whatever you need with uh, those credentials, either log in into a particular account, or like I said, if it's common to be in a corporate environment where you are gonna have Active Directory. So let's try to quickly cover Active Directory authentication, which basically just falls into two different categories, either NTLM and Kerberos. They're technically not mutually exclusive. You can find a domain controller that would allow you to authenticate through NTLM while, while it's actually using uh, Kerberos with other devices. So it's not necessarily mutually exclusive, but normally you will, you will see it in a way that it somewhat is. Like it basically just focuses on, on Kerberos or it has a bunch of legacy stuff. So it's uh, basically stuck with NTLM. Uh, the difference between them, one is basically a challenge response a style of authentication. We're going to see it in, in detail in a little bit, but it uses uh, password hashes that are easier to crack. Whether as Kerberos uses tickets and it uses AES encryption 
unless it's using, again, some legacy system with DES. But if it's using AES, it's going to be harder to crack. So let's talk just a quick overview on NTLM and uh, how it works. It's super easy. Basically, the user uh, authenticates uh, with an application server uh, and says, hey, this is my user. The user will, uh, the application server will reply with a challenge, which is also called a nonce. It's just a random value. And then this nonce gets encrypted with a password hash and is sent back as a response. Now the application server is going to grab that response, it's going to grab the nonce, it's going to talk with the domain controller and say, hey, this guy is trying to authenticate with me. This is the number that I gave him. This is his response. Because the domain controller also has the same password hash for that user, it will be able to also encrypt the nonce, compare it with the result that the user encrypted, and if it is the same, then the authentication is a success, and the user will be allowed to access whatever they were trying to access on that particular uh, service or server. Now, for Kerberos, I try to simplify it. I'm not entirely sure if I actually managed to do that, but I'm going to try to go through it a little bit faster. This one, actually, an easy way to see it is that it works the other way around. Instead of asking uh, the server, hey, I need to access something, and then that server communicating with the domain controller, in this case, you're authenticated directly with the domain controller. You're going to get a ticket, granting ticket, that basically allows you to come back with that and say, hey, now I want to use a particular resource. So in order to get that resource from the domain controller, you say, hey, remember that I already authenticated? Here's my ticket granting ticket. Now I need a service ticket to be able to go and talk with um, whatever service or server you're trying to access, whatever resource within the network you're trying to access, you'll have to follow those steps. You're going to see actually that pretty much encryption is at every single step uh, of the process. So at first, you're encrypting a current time, uh, timestamp. That's to avoid uh, replay attacks with the hash uh, derived from the username and password. Uh, you send that to the domain controller. The domain controller sends back a ticket granting ticket that it's encrypted with a password only known to the authentication server. Once you get that ticket, you can communicate back with the domain controller and start asking for service tickets, which in turn are encrypted, but with a different password that is known to both the domain controller and the application server that you're trying to access. Now, why is this uh, important? Because if we go back here, remember that we talked about Kerberos golden and sil silver tickets? Okay, so. Now that we understand the concept of how all of this ticket works back and forth, basically a generic ticket from the domain controller, a particular service ticket for each service that you need to access. So now I'm going to talk about Mimikatz within other tools performing these different types of attacks. That is uh, overpass the hash, uh, golden tickets, silver tickets. But at the same time, I wanted to show you how you can do this with Minicats actually within other tools. So you can expand on what you can uh, do within other engagement. You're going to have a bunch of different tools, such as the USB rubber jacket, which is basically a, it's mostly known for the uh, physical social engineering that will allow you to uh, get an initial foothold, or uh, you can steal credentials with it. If you plug it in with Minicats, it will run Mimikatz real quick, copy the credentials back to the USB, unplug it, and that's it. You have the, uh, the credentials stored on the USB drive. Uh, another tool that we're going to see is PowerShell Empire, which actually Mimikatz benefits a lot if you manage to run it from PowerShell instead of on, on its standalone version or, or, or through the command. So a combination between PowerShell Empire, which actually has a module uh, for Mimikatz already embedded in it um, will benefit a lot, mutually benefit a lot from being able to get into a device, uh, escalating privileges, and dumping a bunch of credentials and then navigating around into um, 
other devices in the network, pivoting, stuff like that. And then the Metasploit framework, similarly known for, for the exploitation and post-exploitation phase, in particular, Meterpreter will have also a module for Mimikatz already embedded in it. So as soon as you are exploiting or running through the post-exploitation steps, one of the things that you will be able to do is run Mimikatz and obtain credentials, uh, authenticate, pass the hash, uh, tickets, etc. So we'll see how um, that looks, starting off with the USB rubber ducky. I also wanted to add a couple of other uh, devices. Uh, one of them is the DigiSpark AT Tiny, is the one that you see on the right. Uh, it doesn't come with a case unlike the rubber ducky, and it doesn't come with an SD card reader. You can probably attach one to it, uh, but it's kind of wide to actually put it inside a case. Unlike the Wi-Fi dock, which also doesn't come with an SD card, um, SD card reader, but it does come with an ESP, so it has Wi-Fi. It's basically the same thing as the, wi um, the USB rubber ducky, but you can plug it in, leave it in there, and then control it remotely through Wi-Fi. Whichever the case may be, with all of them, you will be able to do an attack that basically you plug it in, you request Mimikatz from the internet, and I'll show that in a bit. Um, you request Mimikatz either from another computer in the network, uh, from uh, Mimikatz uh, website in GitHub, stuff like that. But only with a rubber ducky because of uh, the SD card, you will be able to make the um, SD card show as a uh, USB mass storage device and you will be able to run Mimikatz from there. Now, whichever uh, route you choose, in both cases, you'll be able to run Mimikatz, obtain credentials, dump a bunch of stuff um, that you need for, the, for further attacks. So the top example, this is just a piece of a, of a script. In the top example, you see that it's running PowerShell and that it's basically downloading the Mimikatz executable um, into a local computer. You can, like I said, you can do this either by uh, just going to, uh, to GitHub or just uh, opening up an Apache server. Let's say you have Kali, you're within the network. You open up Apache server, uh, you copy Mimikatz in it, and then you go with the rubber ducky to another computer and you'll be able to load it. Um, the cool thing about the rubber ducky, like I said, you can uh, share the SD card, just put Mimikatz inside, and then you'll be able to take the rubber ducky, plug it in, it will automatically run Mimikatz, run what it needs in order to dump the credentials, save it to the USB, and you unplug it and keep walking. And that's gonna happen super fast um, with the rubber ducky. Now, with PowerShell Empire, um, I wanted to start talking about pass the hash and over pass the hash. If you're using PowerShell Empire, which you might be using to, um, let's say for the initial uh, social engineering attack, you're doing spear phishing, uh, you grab a file, a Word document, you embed it with a PowerShell Empire, you send it, and once it opens, you start, you need to start gaining a little bit of information about the device that you're in, other devices in the network, and then eventually move to those devices or try to obtain information from it. So in order to do this, uh, you can use, of course, Mimikatz. So once uh, PowerShell Empire is running, you can just type Mimikatz, or you can actually load different modules from it. Once you load them, uh, you'll be able to just obtain the same, just like we saw at the beginning, when you obtain the, uh, just the password hash. And then if you're in a situation where you have uh, NTLM authentication, you'll be able to just pass the hash and do regular uh, NTLM authentication. Or Mimikatz allows you to do something really cool that is called overpass the hash. And basically it allows you to get a full Kerberos ticket with just the password hash. In order to do that, uh, you'll see the command that is um, in the picture. You see uh, the command in order to obtain the, uh, the hash. But on the top of, uh, of the slide, you're gonna see the command that it requires a lot more than the other one that just is like you're just specifying logon passwords to just dump the credentials. In this case, you're gonna 
add a bunch of different things like the, the username uh, that you just found, uh, the domain in which you're in, the NTLM hash that you were, uh, that you just got with uh, Mimikatz, and then an app to run. Again, you can uh, run PowerShell ideally, and you'll leverage it a lot more than uh, your regular command prompt. Once you do that, Mimikatz is gonna create or basically prepare a ticket for you. But remember, the way that Kerberos works, you actually need to go to the domain controller and authenticate with it. So what you can do is just use whatever uh, network resource, either shared storage or whatever you need in order to obtain something that uh, will require authentication. And now that that information is there, thanks to Mimikat, it'll be, it will be able to authenticate with Kerberos and it will be able to generate a um, ticket for it. So now let's talk about the next tool, which is the Metasploit framework. And uh, let's talk about now with Kerberos with um, silver and golden tickets, with, which would basically be, if you're in a Pentas engagement, this would probably be um, one of the coolest things to get because it translates into a lot of access either to a bunch of servers with a silver ticket or to the domain controller as an admin with the golden ticket. So first let's talk a little bit about the Metasploit framework. Uh, in a similar fashion than uh, PowerShell Empire, it's gonna have a tool it's going to have a bunch of different modules in it. You can leverage a lot of them and use a bunch of different elements included in them in order to pivot, move around, gather information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one thing to note, though, even though the Mimikatz is included within the Metasploit framework, you're going to see that it's called uh, Kiwi. I would guess it has something to do with the fact that the username of uh, the person who created Mimikatz is gentle Kiwi. So whoever wrote the plugin for me interpreter probably was referencing that. Not entirely sure though. But whatever the case may be, you just put load Kiwi, it will load your regular um, uh, Mimikatz model, and then you'll be able to start using your old fashioned uh, Mimikatz commands in order to create either a golden or a silver ticket. Basically, if we go back to uh, our talk about Kerberos and we said that uh, you first authenticate with a domain controller in order to obtain a ticket granting ticket. It's basically a ticket that allows you to get other tickets, the service tickets, um, which you in turn use in order to access different services or servers uh, around the network. If you were to, by using Mimikatz, obtain any of the password hashes for either one of the servers or better yet for the domain controller you can craft your own ticket granting ticket or your own service ticket if you create your own service ticket that is to access one particular server and you manage to obtain that password hash now you'll be able to uh, create a silver ticket using the password hash for that particular server and with it you can give you permissions in order to access everything on that particular service when you create your own service ticket that allows you to access one particular server in whichever way you deem uh, necessary that's what's called a silver ticket because it allows you to access only one device but with as much access as you need now the same thing, but happening with the domain controller. Now it's the domain controller password hash uh, that you have obtained. Then you can use that to create your own ticket granting ticket. Basically the ticket that allows you to get all the other tickets. That one is called a golden ticket. And one of the cool things it has, similar to the, the service ticket, the service ticket has basically, hey, what does this guy it, what is this guy allowed to do within the server? In a similar fashion, your golden ticket is gonna say, what groups does this user belong to? 
And since you created it, you can make yourself the domain admin. So by simply running uh, Mimikatz, you can see on the lower screenshot uh, to the right, um, the command golden ticket create is actually used to create both the silver and the golden ticket. It just depends, like I said, on, on which password hash you obtain. Is it just a service account or is it a domain account? Uh, depending on whether you are on the domain controller or uh, one of the servers. You create that, you give yourself the appropriate permissions or uh, specify that you belong to the appropriate uh, groups and you'll have basically unlimited access to either one particular server with a silver ticket or to the domain controller and to anything else that you need to with a golden ticket. Now, I didn't want to make this talk too long, so um, I will be doing another talk that will be a red team intro. And one of the things that we're going to talk about um, in it is how to use Mimikatz, but bypassing uh, antivirus and different detection software. Because the tool is very well known, you can imagine that a lot of uh, uh, antivirus software is going to try to pick it up, try to stop it. And there's different techniques in order to try to bypass uh, AV, since there's different techniques in order to actually run uh, Mimikatz. You can run the executable alone. You can get a PowerShell script that will invoke it. Um, so depending on which technique you're going to use, there will be different techniques in order to uh, bypass the antivirus. Uh, if it's just uh, a PowerShell script, you may just replace a couple of the keywords and you'll be able to run the PowerShell script. Um, in other cases, you'll want to obfuscate uh, the PowerShell script. So even the, the stuff that is readable uh, before now won't be able to uh, whatever antivirus or endpoint security solution won't be able to read it because you can actually encrypt it with uh, AES. And of course, last but not least, actually encoding an executable and, and trying to run it in a way that doesn't use anything suspicious uh, for the antivirus. Now, all of that is actually just too much content so I'm gonna leave that. Uh, I'm gonna leave that for the red team intro, and I wanted to leave a little bit of time about uh, for questions, because I know that uh, NTLM and Kerberos it might uh, raise some questions as to where or how you would actually use Mimikatz to obtain that information, move forward, stuff like that. If any of that wasn't clear enough, uh, now will be an excellent moment for those questions. All right. If you guys have questions uh, for this, go ahead and ask them. You can unmute yourself. Let me know if you have any issues. Is there any type of uh, cheat sheet that you'd uh, recommend that you'd seen out uh, out there that uh, we can go right ahead, take a look, and um, um, really start uh, using it specifically with uh, the rubber ducking? Yeah. Um, so let me go back real quick to here it is. So the last line at the bottom is the source for uh, all of the rubber ducky stuff. Um, that's actually from the guy who made the rubber ducky. You can go over there and it actually ex explains in, in, in detail uh, how both uh, attacks would be performed. One of the cool things about the rubber ducky is that you can put it in, I believe they call it like twin duck mode in which it can act as both a keyboard and a USB mass storage. So you should be able to do all of the automation, all of the typing down, all of the putting the commands that you need in order to uh, run Mimikatz, dump the credentials, copy them to a file, 
inside that basically second partition that is the shared uh, SD card. And then just unplug the rubber ducky and you'll have uh, all of the credentials in there. Somebody had mentioned in the chat that there are payload generators online for both the Rubber Ducky and the DigiSpark. Uh, last year, I did a talk on how to make a, um, I think it was a $4 uh, Rubber Ducky um, by using a DigiSpark board. Uh, so Dave and I had fun with that. And uh, Dave is reminding everybody that there are those payload generators out there for both of them. And Dave is reminding us that the DigiSpark is a much cheaper version. Like I said, we did the talk on uh, how to make a $4 rubber ducky with that DigiSpark. Yeah, you can get like uh, 10, no, five for 10 bucks. So it would be like $2 each. And in my case, what I do is, because speaking of the rubber ducky and even the Wi-Fi duck, uh, even though it's a bit cheaper, they're still too expensive to be like dropping around in an engagement. Let's say that uh, you go to the client, uh, go to the parking lot and you wanna drop about a bunch of these USB so somebody will pick it up and plug it in. That's probably not something that you'll wanna do with a $50 rubber ducky, but right. you can buy a pack of uh, five of these uh, DG Sparks for 10 bucks. And then in my case, I used a 3D printer just print that really cheap case because they're too wide to actually fit on the regular uh, USB case. So I just ended up doing my own with a 3D printer, which is, which is super cheap if you consider the price of a filament. And that was it, uh, a cheap way of uh, making a rubber ducky that I, I won't mind if I, if I lose after the engagement. I have one more All question right. for you. Um, you mentioned there's a red team event that you're going to be presenting. Are you also planning on uh, doing a presentation uh, from the blue team perspective, or is that something you've done in the past that I can look up somewhere? Um, I don't remember any uh, blue team that uh, demo specific to that, at least not that what one that I've, I've gone to. I do know that they recently did a couple of uh, monitoring ones that would help, but at least I am not planning on, on, on covering this kind of stuff from a blue team perspective. I could do that. I, I don't think it should be, I think, yeah, I think it, it, it would be a good idea to present both, uh, both sides of it. Uh, we recently um, had an issue with a client which is a client from another department. So we had we had like no idea of, of all of the cyber side. And recently we had to do a couple of uh, incident response. And one of the things that we saw is um, a lot of people using PowerShell Empire and Mimikatz uh, for, for their own attacks. A lot of hackers, even at a, at a more advanced level, like saying full APT groups, just using PowerShell, uh, Empire, Mimikat, and a couple of things like that. So I think it will be a, a very good idea to be to do a talk on about the blue side of that and how to how to respond, analyze, detect uh, this kind of uh, attacks. Great, thank you. Any other questions uh, for this talk or the other? All right, okay. thank you very much, Henry. Really appreciate it, lots of good information there. Um, assuming you'll give us the uh, slides for that as well, is that correct? Yeah, I'm gonna uh, share them through uh, through Slack like the last time. Okay, and then uh, we've got the session recorded. 
So once that's finished processing, I'll give that to Rod and he can upload it wherever he's going to upload it. And they will post that in the event panel, I believe, is where they'll post the link to the presentation. And then, uh, Rod, I wanted to turn it back over to you. Turn it back over to you. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you very much for for attending. Um, keep in touch with us at the Slack, the the social media, and obviously this online meetups, and we'll continue updating depending on how things go. Um, there is more to come today. In uh, around ten minutes, we'll have the meeting for um, OWASP Top Ten API at Pacific Hackers, which which is the the West Coast group uh, uh, of uh, uh, Percent Twenty Seven. So. Uh, join us in a little bit and uh, we'll continue learning and participating. Thank you very much. All right, thanks guys. Cool. Have a great day. Have a great weekend. You too. Bye. Thanks. Ciao, ciao.